I'm going to talk this afternoon about the climate modelling work that we've done under the IAGP project. And with the climate modelling work, we set ourselves three different kinds of questions. The first one was to look at likely side effects of geoengineering. But in a different approach to the SPICE project, we were going to look at a number of different alternative potential geoengineering technologies, but using a consistent modelling approach so we could compare one against another. We also thought we'd move on, rather than using climate models as a predictive tool of what um, geoengineering might achieve, we thought we would try and sort of unpick the detail a little bit and see how well some of the details of geoengineering are represented within the models. And then go on and ask what I think is some fascinating questions about how you, you might actually um, make decisions if you were ever to deploy geoengineering and what some of the challenges um, might be. So I'm going to start off with the first of those questions, which is looking at side effects. And I think Piers this morning sort of show, showed you this slide, which lists the six different approaches that we, we simulated. Five of them involve solar radiation management. In other words, increasing the reflectivity of some part of the Earth's system to, to reflect away the warming sort of solar radiation or, or, or part of it. And then the, the one that's slightly different is cirrus cloud thinning, where you thin the cirrus cloud and, and, and by doing that you enhance the radiation that's emitted by the Earth's surface and its atmosphere and you enhance the amount of that radiation that goes back to space and that also has a cooling impact. And very similar to, to Jim's work, we've also used one of the latest Met Office climate models, HAGEM2. Now in terms of the, the background or the, the framing for our modelling, we've used throughout a simulation of 21st century climate where we implemented geoengineering in our models in 2020. We kept it sort of fixed for 50 years to 2070 and then we suddenly ceased the geoengineering and then let our models run through to 2100 to see what the termination impact would be. Our no geoengineering scenario was RCP 4.5 which has already been, been described so I won't dwell on that, that too much. So let's look at some results. So what we have here are time series which show the temperature trend but I'll point out we're just looking at land temperatures and I decided to focus on that because that's obviously probably most relevant to, to where humans live. And we look at the time series of temperatures from the early 21st century through to the end. And in black, you've got the no geoengineering RCP 4.5 scenario. And RCP 4.5 in our simulations delivered sort of almost 2 degrees Celsius of warming from the end of the 20th century to the end of the 21st. So what do we see? Well, we see all of our geoengineering methods cooled the climate. Some of them, like changing the reflectivity of crops, for example, have a very small impact because you can only increase the reflectivity to a certain extent and there's a limited surface area of the earth that you, you have to geoengineer. Others, like changing the reflectivity of the desert regions, can have a very dramatic impact on land surface temperatures. And the, the impact there is largely due to, first of all, it's quite a large sort of forcing or change to the climate system, but also it's very concentrated and it's concentrated over land and hence it has a large impact on our annual mean land temperature. Other methods like changing the reflectivity of the, of the ocean surface, actually pro probably that's the most effective at returning the, uh, the temperature back to the level it was at the end of the 20th century, which is this flat solid black line with the, the dashed line either side showing sort of plus and minus two standard deviations. But I think there's a message here. Not, none of the geoengineering approaches, except possibly the, the, the desert reflectivity change, but none of them are able to sustain that late 20th century climate in terms of temperature for more than 10 to 20 years. And at which point you would have to go even further in terms of your, ge your ge geoengineering if you wish to maintain climate at late 20th century levels. All of the methods show that climate is very responsive to this simulated geoengineering, which is potentially a benefit if you ever were to, to wish to deploy it sort of quite rapidly, but there's a sting in the tail, which Jim mentioned earlier, which is that you're just storing up the climate change for later on if you suddenly cease the geoengineering, and that's true for all of our methods. And then the final point is that whilst you, you might get an acceptable result in your global sort of annual mean or your land surface annual mean, 
But when you start to look at regions, you see that there are inequalities and the differences in the impact on temperatures. So here I've taken the, the ocean reflectivity change, this green one, which is possibly the most effective of the methods we looked at, but you can still see that you get a larger impact on temperatures in the sort of northern high latitudes in the Arctic, and you also get some variations over different um, continental areas. So what we then did was we thought, well, how can we make sense of those variations? And hence our, our chart where we've, we've changed from a pure temperature change or temperature difference, and we've, we've put the change into one of four different categories. Now, there's, there's nothing sacred about these classifications and the many, many ways of looking at it. But we just thought this would, would help to emphasize how important some of the regional differences are. So I'm just going to take a moment to talk you through the categories and then hopefully the figures will make more sense. So first of all, we thought, well, an insignificant change is one where the, the change from the RCP 4.5, the no ge geoengineering scenario, is actually quite small. And so if, if, if the change is within two standard deviations of RCP 4.5, we said it's insignificant. We can't really un understand what geoengineering is doing. The signal's not strong enough. If we find the temperature change actually moves us back to within two standard deviations of the late 20th century climate in terms of temperature, we thought, well, that's an effective change. That would be a reasonable target, perhaps, to, to set ourselves. And that's, those are the dark blue regions that you see. And then the last two categories, marginally effective, is sort of part way between these two. It's when your temperature change is going in the right direction, you're going back towards late 20th century, but you don't go far enough. And then the one that obviously causes most concern is damaging. And that's everything else. So it includes both extremes. So an extreme where you actually enhance the warming that you're, you're experiencing under RCP 4.5, or the extreme where you cool and you cool far too much. So it just represents a very large change to the, to the temperature climatology that you'd have experienced at the end of the 20th century. So the key points that come out is if you look at these dark blue regions, you see that they vary for the five different methods I've looked at and have not shown the crop reflectivity change because its impact was so small. And also, if we were to rerun one of these simulations, we'd find that even for the same approach, the, uh, if we change the, the, the starting conditions of the simulation, these blue regions would move around as lo a, a lot as well. So there's a lot of uncertainty. And then, you know, of most concern is if you implement a, a very large regional scale geoengineering approach like changing the reflectivity of the surface in the Sahara and the, the Arabian Desert, you see a very, very strong local impact but also it spreads into some of the neighboring regions as well. So whilst you might be able to get your global temperature climate to hit some kind of accepted target, you're going to see regional variations. As well as seeing regional variations in temperature, what we found is that all of our different geoengineering approaches led to side effects. And we decided to focus on precipitation, but equally I could have presented slides here for a number of different climate metrics, and there are, there are many, many side effects. So you see for precipitation, the black line again is the increase in precipitation that you get under RCP 4.5 with global warming. And what you find is that most of the methods reduce precipitation relative to RCP 4.5. Some of them, like the, the ocean reflectivity, which, which produce perhaps the most effective result for temperature, actually reduce it too strongly and go below the mean precipitation level for the late 20th century. But cirrus cloud thinning, because of the different way it, it manages the, the radiation budget at the top of atmosphere, actually increases precipitation. And this, once again, even if your global change is, is acceptable or achieves some kind of target, you see very strong regional changes as well. So here you can see in the mid-latitudes mid you get a drying because you largely related to the, the cooling of the temperature because of geoengineering. And you get the shift in the monsoon and the, the uh, ITCZ. So here the, the red colors show a drying and the blue colors show, show a wetting um, of, of climate. And this is in a 20-year mean for, for, a, for um, a decade when geoengineering from a temperature point of view was probably most effective. <coughs> and if we move on and using the same categories as before, you see very large perturbation to precipitation. You see large areas where you get this, what we've called damaging change. And as I said before, with the temperature, 
the location of these red regions is, varies between the five different approaches, and if we were to rerun the simulations with slightly different starting conditions, we would see that the, the locations would, would, would vary bet between the simulations. So there's a lot of, lot of uncertainty, but this, this figure, I think, emphasises the importance of the issue, even though it doesn't enable you to predict where the adverse impacts may, may be on a regional scale. <coughs> So very quickly, because Piers covered it quite well this morning, in terms of looking at the global models, we decided to look at marine cloud brightening. And we looked at sort of three different aspects of the technology that are not so well captured uh, within global climate models. So we looked at how the effectiveness of the approach varies through the diurnal cycle. As Piers mentioned, we looked at the, the behaviour of the aerosols within a plume. And we also looked at the, the nature of the aerosol. Typically, it's modelled as a dry sea salt crystal. But what happens when you, you introduce water into that crystal, which is likely to be the case in, in, in a real-world situation? And just very briefly, for all three of these, we found that the effectiveness that we got from much more detailed modelling, using much smaller grid cell sizes, using much smaller time steps, was less than in a global climate model. Now, you were left, I'm sure, I hope this didn't spoil your lunch, you were left in a cliffhanger situation this morning wondering whether the Arctic sea ice was going to be saved when the, within the, the planet Hajim world. And um, I think Piers left you with this situation. So you can see our target. You can see the, the pattern of uh, change in, in Arctic sea ice. It's increasing, but not really gaining against target. And you can see northern hemisphere mean temperature. Um, it's not really falling very strongly, and you would expect a, a fall in, in temperature be required to deliver you an increase in sea ice. And at this point, I was beginning to worry about my job even. You know, if we publish a paper and I just show that I can't save the sea ice, it doesn't look very good. So we, 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 um, we really relied an awful lot upon an annual review process. We had a, um, an algorithm which sort of calculated recommendations for, for how to amend the, the amount of SO2 that we injected into our stratosphere. Um, and we looked at the results, we looked at the, the time series, we also looked at changes in top of atmosphere fluxes. And by another couple of years on, by 2039, I think we, we, we finally sort of gained enough confidence to, to make quite a radical change to the controller and to, to the decision making. And so we, we changed the, the pattern of emissions of the SO2. We changed some of the parameters within our automated sort of controller which define the relationship, for example, between northern hemisphere mean temperature and Arctic sea ice cover. And we also changed our estimates of the underlying impact of changes in greenhouse gases and, and aerosols. And once we did that, I've just skipped through to show you the whole of the time series, but you can see within four years, by 2043, we'd achieved target, and we maintained the Arctic sea ice with a little bit of noise, admittedly, but we maintained it around target right through to the point at which we decided we were going to terminate geoengineering. And then, as you've seen already a couple of times today, when you terminate geoengineering, suddenly you get sort of a rapid catch-up of the, of the climate change. So the sea ice dropped down. And that's despite the fact that we had a couple more of these uh, unpredictable volcanoes. They really had no, no last, lasting impact. And here you can see the temperature responds very strongly to, to the cessation of the, of the geoengineering. But the point I want to get across is that we, we didn't become, we didn't sort of get a handle on the uncertainty or, 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 be, or have a very strong degree of control over the uncertainty once we've made these changes. Um, we've, whoops, we had become a little bit better, I think, at making decisions in the face of uncertainty. And we got a little bit better at exploiting our data and a little bit better um, probably because we'd had 20 years in terms of simulation time, 20 years of experience, which hopefully we're starting to reflect in, in the way we were using the tools. And just to emphasise the uncertainty very quickly, there's four, four um, little plots here. The first one shows you the difference in temperature between the last <coughs> 10 years that we were geoengineering and the 10 years before we started geoengineering to um, remediate the Arctic sea ice, with the red region showing, showing warming and the blue region showing cooling. And the challenge that we would have each year is, well, what's our contribution to this? How much of it is natural variability? How much is, of it is due to changes in aerosols or greenhouse gases? 
and we couldn't use a control simulation. We couldn't go back and rerun things and, and tweak it. We just had to take each year and use the accumulated time series of data. So by looking at the time series and trying to fit t trends, we came up with, with this sort of picture here. And this picture is our attempt at trying to, um, to describe what the geoengineering was doing in terms of temperature change with blue cooling and red warming. But if you look carefully, you see that most of the globe is hatched. And that means that the change that we've calculated is, is not statistically significant. In other words, you know, there's too much uncertainty to make a clear, a clear decision about the role of geoengineering in terms of the temperature change. And then it's interesting that afterwards, with the benefit of hindsight, when we did allow ourselves to, to run a control run, this shows the difference in temperature that is just due to our geoengineering. So you can compare this plot with this. And some of the structure is the same, but some of it's very different. The sign and the magnitude varies quite a bit. And then the final plot here is, is back to our different classifications. And, and once again, it shows that it's an important issue because there are the regional differences in, in how effective the geoengineering was once you start to con consider its impact beyond um, the, the Arctic sea ice. And the final point is that this sort of interactive simulation using a control a control sort of algorithm and a regular annual review, we, we, we think has got a much broader um, uh, benefits than just this one simulation we ran. Um, climate models quite often have to do a number of trial and error runs to find the appropriate level of change to introduce. And using a control perspective could well deliver that more efficiently. But also it, it enables us, I think, to get a much better understanding of some of the issues that might accompany deployment of geoengineering, particularly in making decisions and trying to deal with uncertainty. So if I can quickly sort of summarise, in terms of key science insights, you know, just using marine cloud brightening as an example, I'm sure we'd find sim similar issues with other approaches. We looked into some of the detail and how well they're, they're represented in climate models and found that certainly for the three cases we looked at, the climate models are likely overstating the impact of the geoengineering. For our global scale modelling, we found that there are regional differences in temperature. So you're going to get, get inequalities that creep in, even if your global mean changes um, according to your target. And you get, it's almost, uh, it would appear almost un unavoidable to, to, to try and prevent side effects like changes in precipitation. And then finally, for perhaps on a more positive note, we see that there's a great opportunity to, to gain benefit in future from more interactive simulations sort of akin to what we, we were doing with the Arctic sea ice. And then very finally, in terms of recommendations, I'd encourage you, if you haven't already, to have a look at our briefing notes, which sets them out in more detail. But just to emphasise a couple of points, I would say that if you are going to geoengineering any point in, and, and ever can contemplate deployment, you need to be able to detect and attribute changes in climate with a, a reasonable degree of accuracy before you, you, you deploy geoengineering. Without that, it's going to be very difficult to make effective decisions and guide, and guide the geoengineering. And also, as we found, given the regional variations in results, it's important now that global modelling moves on to much more of a regional focus and a focus on, on impacts that are relevant to, to people and ecosystems. Thank you very much. And I'm now going